But it is great, it's Resurrection Sunday. Um, and aren't you pleased that in all across the globe, um, Jesus' resurrection um, affects and infects everybody. It's changed the whole trajectory of history and science. Everything around the world is based upon Jesus Christ and God. Uh, a lot of times the scientists try to disprove it. And we've heard this weekend through John how the word of God is the, the authority of Christ upon the earth. How the word of God speaks truth and the word of God doesn't lie. And, um, you know, it's interesting that you've got the AD and then BC after Christ and uh, the whole aspect of before Christ, if you like, but obviously God. And everything we do, even our birthdays, the reason our birthdays are scaled how they are, is because of Christ. Um, I don't know about you, but the world is infected and affected. In fact, they've got God on their hands and they don't realize it. That's why they're all searching all the time. There might be, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, there might be Mormons, um, they may be called Normans, depending what your kind of world you come from. Um, but somebody's searching for a saviour, and uh, they're not realising that Jesus is the saviour of the world. And we get to celebrate today the resurrection of Christ. Um, and I love this in, in, Mark, in Matthew 28 here, and what it says. I, I love these scriptures. And the title here is, He is Risen. He says this, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I mean, that's like, I mean, that's amazing, isn't it? That, I mean, some of us are sat on chairs today. Um, and um, some of us are sat on sofas, um, but no matter where we sit, this angel sat on the actual stone that was rolled away. Um, I mean, imagine that, like, you know, the view of Jesus saying, I'm going to rise, and then all of a sudden you get that an angel sat on a stone, uh, almost kind of just like chilling out, resting, relaxing, and I love that description there, that this angel is sat on it, his countenance was like lightning, and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. Imagine that. So there's a man that was dead that was resurrected. And all of a sudden, the guards, they become like dead men. Um, and I find that interesting. Verse 5, but the angel answered and said to the woman, do not be afraid. Have you ever noticed when God shows up, we're not to be afraid? When man shows up, the world shows up, difficulty shows up, we're afraid. Let's be honest, we can get afraid. But here he says, do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified, past tense. I love this. So who Jesus who was crucified. And verse 6, this is a thrilling verse. And he says, he is not here, he has risen. Amen. Maybe we've come to the mortuary this morning, or you maybe you're still jet lagging or something, I don't know. But it says, He is risen. He's risen, amen. amen. You know, the, the Buddhists and the Mormons and the Hare Krishnas and the Muslims, they worship all the time. They shout and scream. Going to Bradford, you can't, even if a Bradford City game's on, you hear them over the tenoy, over the city. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, calling people to prayer. You get to church on a Sunday morning, it's like, Where's my Easter egg? But listen, it says this, he is not here, he is risen. Listen to this next bit. Has he said it has come true? See the place where he lay. You see, Jesus isn't a liar. Jesus fulfills exactly what he says he's going to fulfill. We've heard this weekend about the promises of God that are yes and amen, that he's the Alpha and Omega, that his light shines in the darkness and that he brings resurrection life where we may be in a tomb. And so there he says, look, he is not here. He is risen. As he said, it has come to pass. That's the promise that is an eternal promise. Let's stand up this morning, shall we? And uh, enjoy the King of Kings and Lord of Lord. We thank you this morning, Lord, for the resurrection life in our bones, in our bodies. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you, Lord, have raised the dead. You've cast out devils. You've cleansed the lepers. And we decree and we declare over the atmosphere of Eden, Lord, that you can bring salvation. You can bring hope. Lord, we pray even in our own lives and our own turmoil and situations or circumstances. Lord, whether it's marriages, whether it's finances, whether it's health, mentally, spiritually, physically. Lord, we decree and 
and declare, Lord, that you will bring resurrection life into our mortal bodies this morning. Lord, into your church, not only here in Yedon, but across the United Kingdom, that our, our churches would rise again with the resurrection truth that Jesus is alive. God's not dead. He's surely alive, living on the inside and active on the outside. And we decree and declare, Lord, as we lift your name high this morning, that, Lord, you would be glorified, you would be magnified, that, Lord, our minds would be alert, Lord, our hearts would be receptive, Lord, to what you want to say and what you want to do, that we give glory, we give honor, we give adoration to you, Lord. Just move by your spirit this morning. And we thank you that, Lord, you are the truth, you are the way, and that you are the life. And that we live by you. We stand by you. We be, believe in you, Lord. That you are our Savior and our Messiah. Yahweh, have your way this morning. Yahweh, have your way. Speak to us in your precious name. And everybody said? Thank you. Thank you, Denver. Good morning, everyone. And, uh, you know, the, the early Christians used to greet one another by saying, He is risen. And the reply was, He is risen indeed. If I say he is risen, what do you say? He is risen indeed. He certainly is. It's been an absolute joy. Denver, thank you for your invitation to be with you, all these great folk. Thank you. I said it yesterday. It's great to be preaching to people or sharing with people who have got a great heart to receive the word of God. That's you, isn't it? And a great openness to the word of God. And Denver, let me say th thank you for allowing me to minister alongside these amazing folk here. Why don't you just give a mighty hand of praise to the Lord for the way we've been led in worship. And, you know, I don't get to minister with these people often, but when I do, it always blesses me, I'm telling you. So um, it's been wonderful. Now I'm going to speak this morning on Resurrection Morning, starting off with a, th a story in the Bible that we don't associate with Easter, but I'll explain why we're doing it. I'm going to, talk, I'm going to call it Three Steps Around the Cross. And so we're going to be talking about Three steps that are vital for us to appreciate totally what it means that Jesus is alive. And if you have your Bible with you, and I do obviously quote the scripture all the time, and you'll be hearing a bit of it this morning. We're in Luke 19, and I want us to look at the story, would you believe, on resurrection morning of Zacchaeus. Because the story of Zacchaeus was hours before Palm Sunday. We never put this story in the Easter week. Because it's, it really starts in many people's minds with Palm Sunday, but it's a powerful story. And I'm going to read it to you. I know I'm talking to people who know the Bible well here, uh, but sometimes, you know, we can miss the obvious because we think we know something well. When I'm reading the Bible daily, I think, oh, well, I think I know that story well enough, and then uh, I'll probably skip that fast, and then God shows you something. I don't know if you're like me, but I've been reading the Bible for a long, long time now, and yet I still come across things, I think, where on earth did that come from? I've never seen that before. Is that happened to you? Hey, no. How on earth did I not see that? It's unbelievable. Right, here we are, Luke 19, and it says, Jesus entered Jericho, was passing through, and a man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, let's explain about, I guess we, we don't like hearing about tax collectors. None in this morning, is there, tax collectors? My wife was a tax collector once, but not like Zacchaeus, happily. The Romans wanted to get tax, but the Romans didn't want the trouble of going around collecting tax. So what they did, they got people who were willing to work with them. Now, many people weren't willing to work with the Romans because they were a fascist uh, occupational army. Uh, they were under, so the folk that they were getting the taxes from, obviously people in Israel, as we would say today, uh, they were being taxed by an occupational power. And you were seen to be a quisling, as they call them in the Second World War, a collaborator. So people didn't want the job. So to make people get the job, they would say, look, we want from everybody X amount of tax. We don't care how much you get out of them. And if you want to double the tax, it's great. You keep the difference, but we want our tax. So Zacchaeus was wealthy because he was a swindler. He was a swindler. And uh, that's why the Bible talks about tax collectors and sinners in the Bible, because they were swindlers. And um, they, he would make a lot of money. He was a wealthy man. And, uh, he would, and people knew, he would despise. But people wouldn't talk to him, uh, because he was making money out of them, and they knew it. But he had the power of Rome behind him. And if they didn't give the tax, 
they could be killed. So this is the guy, Jesus is walking along and he stops, as you'll see, at a tree and with somebody who is despised and the people would be amazed that he's even talking to this man. You know the story of the woman at the well? They were amazed he spoke, it, the, the, they, he would speak to a, a Samaritan woman or even a woman at all in that culture. So let's go on from there and we're going to see an amazing moment in this passage. And so a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. Now, <laughs> when, when Jesus stopped his tree, all eyes went from Jesus to the tree. And they saw it was Zacchaeus and he thought, right, what we're going to do now, we're going to watch this man humiliated in front of everybody. Jesus is going to point the finger and is going to say, you are a swindler, you are an evil man, you are corrupt, and you're destined for hell, and he, that's what they expected. And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, can you come down? I think you and I should have a brew. Because that's basically what he said. I wanna, I'm going to spend time at your house for tea. I'm going to spend some time. This is what he says. Well, it, that's what the, the kids' uh, Sunday school chorus says. But this is what the Bible says. Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people uh, began to mutter, you know why. And he's gone to the house to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said, Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. My goodness me, he's turned around, isn't he? And Jesus has not confronted him with anything. But when you get into the presence of Jesus, you see things in your life you've never seen before. Peter, big macho guy. Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Jesus hadn't talked about his sin. But when you're in the presence of Jesus, you, you realize what you've been carrying for a long time. And just because he was in God's presence, God gave him revelation. You know, David says, Lord, I, the psalmist says, I, I can never get away from you. If I go to the east, you're there. If I go to the west, you're there. If I go into the heaven, you're there. If I go into the depths of the sea, you're there. I can't get away from you. And then he says, I don't want to get away from you. I'm going to stand still, search me, O oh God, and know my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. And cleanse me. Being in the presence of Jesus reveals things that we were carrying that we never before. And he immediately repented. He immediately repented. Earlier this week, um, I um, <laughs> did one almost. I know what's going to happen when I give this illustration. Um, I burnt my back. Now, the question is, how did I burn my back in this weather? How did that happen? And if I don't say what happened, then you're going to spend the rest of the 20 minutes I'm preaching not listening to me, wondering how I could possibly burn my back. Um, but I burnt my back. And I said to my wife, listen, can you um, take my phone here and just, just take a picture of the back? You'll see how bad it is. And um, I, I, you look, you're, all, you're thinking about it already, aren't you? It's sauna blanket. Don't buy a sauna blanket. That's all I'm saying to you. And... There was a burn on my back. She took the picture, and I looked at this picture, and I realized something. I have never seen my back before. In my 40 years of age, <laughs> in my 75 years of age, I'd never seen my back. I've lived with it all my life, and I've never seen it. You never. And don't look so surprised. You've never seen yours, most of you. When you encounter Jesus... Whatever you've lived with for however long, he must have thought he was a super businessman. He must have thought he was an absolute top of the tree, the money he was making. But in the presence of Jesus, he saw what he'd been carrying for years and immediately says, I've got to turn around. I've got to turn my back in where I was. Here's the first step. You say, John, where are we? What's this got to do with Easter Sunday? You're going to see in a minute. Because when you encounter, and I encounter Jesus, if God's going to do anything in our lives, there has to be, listen, a step down. Say it with me, step down. Step down. You see, he thought, I am a wealthy man, 
Jesus is well known, and uh, I'd like to see him. I'd like to be an observer. Now, think of that word. will come up again in the Easter story. I'd like to be an observer. Just an observer. I don't want to get committed. I don't want to talk to Jesus. I don't want him to talk to me. I want to hide where I am and look down. He's a little man. Look down on Jesus. You know, one of the biggest reasons why people can't encounter God before they're Christians or why they can't experience God deeply when they are Christians, like most of us this morning, excuse me, it is because we can't climb down. The moment we become a Christian, we realize that we're sinners. Before I was married, uh, I was a pastor, as I said earlier, 21 years of age, and I wasn't married when I um, first became a pastor in South Wales. And uh, I was in a, a small church in a village called Flantrissen. It's a big place now. It's where the Royal Mint is. And uh, I had to stay in what was called digs, lodgings. And I lodged with this couple who were not Christians, nice people, um, but they wanted some money by bringing a lodger in, so that was me. And they provide uh, accommodation for me to there, and I had a, uh, a meals with them. And so that was okay for a while, until some, one Sunday morning, um, got very well with them, you know. Uh, one Sunday morning, they said to me when I came back from the morning service, what did you preach on today, John? And uh, they wouldn't call me pastor, wouldn't know me as a pastor in that way. They knew I was, I was a pastor, and I said, well, I spoke on grace. So what does grace mean? I said, well, the Bible says all of us are sinners and, and we're having roast beef, you know, it's just a nice meal. We're all sinners and we all need Christ's forgiveness and we deserve judgment, but God gives us unexplained grace. They said, what did you just say? We're all sinners. We're not sinners. I said, we're all sinners. You're sinners, I'm sinners. He said, well, you're leaving here. We're not staying anymore in this house. I said, you've gone nowhere for me to stay. I mean, it's not like Bradford where there's lodging houses or there's... Uh, hotels, and said, we're well, leaving. You're leaving at the end of the month. You paid us to the end of the month. Unless you say that we're not sinners. Unless you say that we're not sinners and say we're so. I said, we're all sinners. I did it as nice as I could. And all right, the end of the month, and that was it. All right? And off I crumble that day. That, that was me finished. So I went through. I thought, where well, am I going to stay? And there was a tiny room in this church. It was this kind of building. And uh, it was about the size of what the blues are there and in it was a small table and a chair and there was a couch and I got a sleeping bag in order to move my life into there just because I'd said to somebody what the Bible says but when I came downstairs to leave the house at the end of the month and I'd give them a gift because that's what grace is about hello that's what great and I bought them a lovely gift didn't have much I was on about eight quid a week with no other income. And of course it bought a lot more in those days, but still, I bought them a lovely gift. And I left it for them. I didn't actually, I wanted them to see it when I'd left, but they actually saw it earlier and looked at it. And I came downstairs in my suitcase and they said, um, tears in their eyes, we don't want you to go. And I said, well, I'm, I'm, I can't go back on what the Bible says. Everybody's a sinner, can't do it. Well, we don't want you to go and just stay, we feel terrible. Uh, but a lady in the church, an elderly lady, I was in my twenties, and a lady, Noel Richards, grandmother actually, took me in. You see, friends, unless anybody can step down from self-righteousness, they cannot be saved. There is no compromise. The first, you know, ego, we know it's a, um, a psychological world, Freudian world, word, but ego... We can say as Christians means edging God out. When our ego gets in the way of what God wants to do in our life, in church life, ego is one of the, um, the a willingness of people to humble themselves before God and one another. Jesus says the way up is the way down. Faith gains the most, someone once said, but humility keeps the most. The first step to encounter God and in a deep way. Now that's not just when we're saved. We're talking about when you and I, resurrection morning, we have to keep the self in check. We have to keep the ego in check. Paul says, I die daily. I die daily in God. I die to myself. I die to my ambitions. I, you know, you see musicians and you see Barra and you see Stephen Bell 
and you see talented people. I know them well, and there's been times in their life, and I hope they don't mind me saying this, when they have obeyed the voice of God, stepped down from things which are financially comfortable, but because they're putting Jesus first, they've gone through periods of sacrifice in order to be obedient to God. That's why God uses them. He doesn't just use them because they're talented. He uses them because there's times when they've stepped down from what the world says success is into the place where God says success is, and then God elevates them. You want to be great in the kingdom of God, be the servant of all. Someone say amen. You've got to keep our ego up. So the first step we're looking at is a step down. We can't step down, we'll never move into what God wants in our life. One great man said, uh, in the Victorian preacher, he said this. He said, I used to think that God gifts were on one step, one above another. And the bigger I got, then the higher I could reach. He says, I now realize that God's gifts are on levels one below another. And the closer I get to Jesus, and the more I humble myself before God, the more I get them. In our garden, um, we have in the front garden, we have an apple tree. As fan, the thing I know about my apple tree is this. The branches with the most fruit hang the lowest. And the branches with the least fruit hang the highest. Think about that. There's people, you know, project themselves, project themselves, project themselves. And I don't see a lot of fruit in their life. There's other people who just put Jesus first, put others first. And my life, I think I want to be like them. I want to be like them. Step down. That's the first thing. And that's hours before Good Friday. Zacchaeus was willing to step down from a tree. And within a week, Jesus had allowed people to put him on a cross, on a tree. So, stepping down. Then, I want us to come to a next part of the, of the Easter story that is familiar. John chapter 19. Now, when you read John chapter 19, there are lots of people around the cross. Some people leave because they don't want to be associated with Jesus. Other people, like the Pharisees and the religious people, mock him. And said, if you are the Messiah, come down from the cross. But there are people there that um, it's remarkable to see them. One of them is Joseph of Arimathea. You know him, don't you? Joseph of Arimathea. He was a believer, but he didn't let his, his belief in Jesus be known because he was afraid of how it would affect his business. And so he was a secret disciple. And so he's there in the vicinity, he's a secret disciple, and he's standing by the cross. The Bible doesn't say in the passage I'm going to read you, he was at the cross at the moment, but it must have been for, that, for what happens next. And he must be thinking, Look, I was worried what people thought of me. I was worried how it affected my business. I'd worry how it affected my life. I was worried about the Roman occupation people, whether I would get contracts. I was worried about all of that, and yet here is the Son of God, who I know is the Son of God. He is being crucified in open shame. And I'm going to step out. I'm going to step out. See, the first, the first thing is stepping down. The second thing, I'm going to step out. This is what the Bible says. It says, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body, the representation, the representative of Rome. Uh, authority in that vicinity. He asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. Mark's Gospel says he came boldly. He came total transformation, like Zacchaeus, who stepped down. Now he's stepping out, he's made things known, he's standing up for what he believes in. And he came down and he took the body away. But the, one of the most phenomenal verses in the Easter story for me is the next one. Because he wasn't only the one who was at the cross, who was a secret disciple. Nicodemus was there. Do you remember Nicodemus? He came to Jesus at night time. Why did he come at night time? Because he was one of the chief people in the Jewish uh, religious structure. And he didn't want to be seen going to Jesus to say the words, I don't know how to get to heaven. 
I don't know how to have eternal life. He didn't want to be seen. So he came at Jesus. And if you look at the narrative, you found that Jesus has been very, very busy today. And when that day, and when he opened the door, he could think, oh my goodness, man, I can do without this. We're going to have a debate. We're going to have an argument with this man. Jesus never turns anybody away, brings them in. He says, uh, what, what would you want? He says, I, I want to know how, how, uh, how to have eternal life. He said, well, you've got to be born again. He said, you mean I've got to go back into my mother's womb and be born? He says, no, that which is born is of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that you should be born again. But he went back and he stayed a secret believer. Stayed a secret believer. But on this day, everything changed. Like it did for Zacchaeus, he changed entirely because he'd been at the cross as well. And I could see the moment where Joseph of Arimathea says, I'm going to step out boldly. He looks across and his eyes catch Nicodemus. He said, I'm not going on my own. Now look at this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Easter story. He said, he went to Pilate boldly. He came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the other secret disciple, the man who earlier, the Bible says, had visited Jesus at night. And then, of course, they take the body of Jesus, and they put it in the tomb. Friends, I want to tell you, what Den Denver said earlier, with what's happening in our nation, it's time that the believers st stepped out. When I was preparing this message for you, about two weeks ago I started it, this particular message. I was sitting in the room in the house where I do my study and spend time with the Lord. And I had a, a, an Apple Watch on, and an Apple Watch at that used to say, if you've been inactive for a while, you know, so how many of you got, you know what I'm talking about, um, a little thing flashes up, you've been sitting too long. And uh, as I'm writing and preparing this word at this point, the Apple Watch said, it's time to stand. I thought, wow, thank you, Lord. Even Apple understand this. It's time to stand. And people aren't talking at work. They're not coming out at school and university very often. They don't want to be seen to be different to the crowd. They don't want to have finger. They don't want to be called a, you know, a Bible puncher. They don't want to be identified. But I want to say to you, whether it affect, there are people, uh, Christian concerned, you know, are one of the most amazing charities. Well, not a charity, organizations in this country who defend people, teachers, hospital workers, who've stood out for what they believe. Doctors who've been threatened with their job taking away from them because they've offered to pray for a, pa a, a patient. But they knew that it's going to cost them something, and yet they decide they're going to stand. It's time to stand. It's time to stand. It's time to stand. I was in preaching in South Africa, Cape Town, on one occasion. Big, I'm sorry, I wasn't preaching there. I was attending a conference in Cape Town. And uh, a man came to me in the lunchtime, and he said, could you just come out in the for a moment, and I want you to meet a man called Fashid. I said, who, sorry, I, don't, I didn't know the man who was asking to me. I said, I want you to come and meet my Fashid. Uh, um, so I said, certainly. So I went out. We sat by this fountain, I remember. And I said, hello, Fashid. Uh, I said to this little guy, why do you want me to, I knew, why do you want me to meet him? Fashid was a young church planter in Iran. And he was involved in a network of church planters. And many of them have been taken into the worst prison in the Muslim world, which is even prison. I pray every day. I prayed every single day for Christians in even prison, apart from the persecuted church. And they'd been tortured. And he said, John, this is the situation. You can't, we can't get you into Iran to meet these young people. And when I talk about young people, I'm talking about people in their 20s and 30s, lovely young guys, their partners and wives say and they'd been through persecution and torture in even prison and I said well where do I come in this so we said well we consider you a spiritual father and we want to get you into a more moderate Muslim country we're going to get these guys out who have gone through all of this terrible time I want you to meet with them for three days and we're not asking you to do leadership stuff we're not asking you to do PowerPoint presentation we're asking you to pour out your heart as a father into sons and daughters. The biggest privilege I've ever been offered in my life. 
Well, the Arab Spring happened and I couldn't get into the, into the nation that they'd chosen, but eventually I got to Istanbul. And I went for three days, you know, one particular day from breakfast time, and I was sharing with them from breakfast time, I didn't have a break apart from to go to the loo in the, or to eat. And when I ate throughout the whole day, they told me story after story of persecution because they were in the underground church. Fashid wasn't there, the man who'd arranged it, because he was in infirm prison, they caught him, and he was there for six years just for preaching the gospel. When I met with people like that, you almost wonder if you're saved, to be honest with you, compared with the sacrifice that they've got. When we, when we've got the resurrection message, we know that Jesus, you know, is alive, and we don't share it, and we don't speak to people because how it might affect us, how it might affect us. My illustration of my accommodation is pretty weak, isn't it, compared with those people. I want to say this Resurrection Sunday, you know, we could be very triumphalist, and there's a lot to be triumphant about in the story, but there are challenges. We're really going to get to the grip of what the resurrection doesn't mean just for these four walls, but for our communities, for where we live. Then it's time to stand. There's a step down that's vital, and there's a step up and a step out there that's vital too, like Joseph and Nicodemus that day. And then we come to John 20, the final step. And we come to Easter Sunday, a step down, humbling ourselves before God. And for incidentally, humility doesn't say that going around saying, oh, we're rubbish, Lord, we're absolutely useless. Let me show you what I mean by this. That is who you and I put yourself or I put myself, that is who we really are in God. If we elevate ourselves to make ourselves out more than we are, that's called pride, isn't it? And pride's a sin, isn't it? But if we denigrate ourselves below what we are, that's also a sin. So it's not going around to how rubbish we are, it's saying, I am weak in myself, I step down, I, I kneel at the cross, I say, Lord, I can't do anything without your strength. But we then say, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So it doesn't, don't, humility is not putting yourself down. It's being real about where we are. I'm humble enough to step down, brave enough to step up. And then we come to the final part, which I want to bring to you from John 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and she saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. That's John. That's the one who's closest to Jesus. And John is writing this, so therefore he doesn't say, you know, um, I'm the one who was there. He just said that the other disciple, that's how he had considered himself. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. So Peter's this great, big, tall, macho fisherman, and he's running. And, uh, uh, and then there's John who we get the picture of the pic in the scripture that he's more slight and, um, uh, and not fragile, but he's much smaller than Peter. And they set out together. They set out together. But, and look what now happens when they get to the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple, that's John, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Do you notice that? He reached the tomb first. Then Simon Peter came along, lumbering behind him, and went straight to the tomb. He saw the strips of linen laying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus. The cloth was still lying in its place. And finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. Also went inside. He saw and they believed. So John gets there first, but he doesn't enter in. John stays there, as a word I said I'd use earlier on, as a spectator to the fact that Jesus was risen from the dead. He's just a spectator. Peter comes on later, but he overtakes John, and he goes in, and he enters into the truth of the re resurrection. And that's the third thing I want to say today. Number one is the stepping down, like Zacchaeus, on the day before Palm Sunday, stepping out like Nicodemus and Joseph Arimathea. But God wants us to step into all that the resurrection means for our life. That's what God wants for you, and that's what God wants for me. I want to put a graphic on the 
screen now as of the final five or ten minutes of where we are. Um, have you got it there? Well, while they're finding the graphic and while they're putting it on there, the Bible says that we're body, soul, and spirit. Did you know that? We're made of three parts. A body is, I wait for the graphic to appear. There you are. The body is the, what the Bible calls the outer man. Everybody in the world born has got a body. And the body is com obviously th communicates to the environment through the five senses, taste, touch, healing, um, um, hearing, and so forth. And that's our stairway to our environment. We've all got a body. And so we communicate by the stairway of the senses. Then there is another part which the world calls the personality, the Bible calls the soul, and that's made up of the mind, the emotion, and the will. We'll come back to that in a moment. Mind, emotion, and will. Now, everybody is born with body and soul, but they have a dormant or unresurrected spirit. The soul is our communication to one another. So I hear a music, but it's, but it's not my hearing that says that's amazing music. It's my soul that says, wow, that's great. Even if it's soul music, it's something that, it's the soul. So I would, I would see, I've used this man as an illustration before, I see Keith with my eyes, but it's my soul that appreciates them. Are you following me? And we're all born with body and soul, but with a dormant or unresurrected spirit. Because our spirit, which the Bible calls the innermost man in the book of Romans, that is our stairway to God. That's how we, in God. So, so go back to Nicodemus. He couldn't understand what Jesus was saying. He said, I must be born again. We said, you'd be born with body and soul. Everybody is. But... You, your spirit was dead. It's, it was, needs to be resurrected. And so you need to be made alive in the spirit. Amen? And when that's alive, then you will experience God. Because before anybody experiences God, the Bible is just an interesting book. But then it becomes the book when we're saved that reads us. It's the, it's the word of God into our lives. And so body, soul, and spirit. And only, so anybody who's not yet a Christian are only two-thirds alive. They've got a body and a soul, but they haven't got a spirit alive. When we, you became a Christian, your spirit became alive. Now, there's two important things as we, before we close. It's this. When the devil tempts us, he always tempts us from the outside in. I'm, talk, right? I'm talking about, about Christians now who are alive in God. He tempts us from the outside. So the first temptation, God, uh, the uh, serpent says to Eve, as God said, that you should not take of the fruit. She hears it through her senses, and then she takes, she touches, then she tastes. All of the physical senses are involved, smelling the fruit. She eats it. All of them are involved. The next, and so she does this, gives it to Adam. He does the same thing. He uses his body, sense, his senses, and he, he takes it. But now, with Adam, it affects his soul. Because now he becomes fearful. Because he knows his sin. And God cries out to him in the garden, Adam, where are you? Now, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He didn't want a GPS, uh, you know, number to find out where he was. God knew where he was. He wanted to say, Adam, you're not where you should be. You need to come back and identify you've left me. And he says, Lord, yes, I'm here. You know where I am. Well, I admit that I'm lost. Said, I took of the fruit of the tree, I disobeyed you, I obeyed you. And the Bible says, God and Adam walked for pleasure in the cool of the, of the garden. And uh, uh, he says, Lord, I'm hiding, I'm hiding, I'm in hiding. Then something happened. God has said, if you take the fruit of the tree, you will die. He didn't drop down dead physically, but his relationship with God died. And not until Jesus' second Adam came, could we re re have the fellowship that we used to have with God. That we used to have with God. So this is, what, this is what sin does. It affects us through the body first, into our soul, and then, because she thought, had Eve and Adam used the mind, used the emotion, this looks good for food, and then I will disobey, and then it, it affected their spirit, and they're separate from God. Now here's the great news. When God works with us this Easter, he works from the inside out.
He works from the inside out. God speaks to us in our spirit. He then gets into our soul, our mind, emotion and will. And then we do what we should do. The verse to look at when you get home is uh, Philippians 2.12. Work out. Someone say work out. Work out your salvation. So out. You start in, in first into the spirit. God speaks by the Holy Spirit inside us. Then it speaks we work it out into the soul, mind, emotion, and will. I will do what God has challenged me for over this Easter pe period, and then I actually physically do it. And sometimes as a pastor, I'd be standing at the door in the days when, you know, you used to stand at the door and shake hands with the people going out. And people would say to me, thank you for the word, to Pastor, that merely made me think. But the purpose of me preaching is not to make people think. It's for people to do. Because someone can hear the word inside, say about tithing, for example, which, or giving to God, or being generous, or witnessing, or standing out. Let's take the one I said before about coming out for God, not being brave about our, the fact we're Christians. You hear it preached in here. You say thanks to Denver at the door for challenging you. Mind, you're absolutely right, Pastor. Emotion, I really felt bad this morning that I haven't been clear about where I am. And then... I really will do something about it, and I'm going to make it clear that I'm a Christian to my neighbours. If we go out and don't do that, we've not worked it out. It's still stuck. It's stuck. Some people, it doesn't even get past God speaking to them. They don't even get to the mind, emotion, and will. They don't even get the, out into the soul. And when they get into the soul, it doesn't get out into the body. Let me end with this illustration. Are you with me this morning? I think some of you are, anyway. You come into park outside here today and um, you can't wait to get into the meeting. You've heard these musicians are going to be playing. You're already singing resurrection songs. You can't wait to get into church. You love being with your friends. And yes, you're absolutely so right with God. Your spirit is really open to everything that God's going to do. You've just gone into the final parking space. You were there first. And somebody, I won't say it's a man or a woman, somebody gets in before you and pinches your space. So now things begin to change. You've seen it. How dare, I'm going to say she, let's say, let's say, let's say he. How dare he do that? Mind starts to, because your body's seen it. Your mind begins, this is absolutely ridiculous. I was here first and now I'm not, I'm not where am I going to part? My emotions, I'm upset because of what they've done. And I will have to have a word with him or her about this. I will have to have a word. I can't let this go because I've had to go half a mile away from the church to get here, uh, to get in. Then you come in, they're all leading this worship, and you can't worship. Because it's affected your spirit now. And you're having communion. And this man says, let's examine ourselves and so let's eat the bread. Oh, I don't want to do anything. I'm sick of this. This is incredible. I've been coming to this church for years. That's always my spot where it is there. And she's done that. And, why have it, what, and this and that and the other. You see, it's got from the body to the soul. It's affected our spirit. And then Denver says, let us leave our gift at the old and get things right. And then you begin to think, my goodness me, wait a minute. This is ridiculous. It's a parking spot. It's a parking spot. Jesus has died for me on the cross, being resurrected from the dead. And I am upset about parking spot. In fact, that person may not have even seen me. No, I, I was going for that space. I don't know. And you look across. The Holy Spirit says, where's the graphic gone? The Holy Spirit says, wake up. <laughs> I got you there. I go, oh, it's disappeared. So, but I'm really gracious about it. Isn't it? See that? You're allowing the Holy Spirit to work. And it um, doesn't matter. You've done it. Is it, haven't the guys on the tech done a great job this weekend? Let's say thank you to them. So now, come on, we're finishing in a moment. Now in our spirit, we, this person says, this is ridiculous. God says, you know, you, this is, get your priorities right. Now it moves out, working out your salvation, gets into your mind. It is ridiculous. It gets into your emotions. When it gets into the emotions, oh, I really did. I want to be reconciled. I shouldn't be thinking like this. And I will do something about it. And you can't wait. It now moves into your body and you slip out while people are praying. You go over to that person who did it and say, sorry, my spirit was wrong this morning. I don't know whether you even saw the parking. I, don't, 
I don't want to get trivial, you know, allow trivial things to upset me. Um, and they get it right, it's now worked out into the body, something's been done about it, and all of a sudden, you could worship straight away. Someone say amen. Now, that's okay if you're talking about a parking spot, but I know folk who for years have fallen out with folk, even in church, and they've never got to where they should be in God because they haven't reconciled. I was preaching in my own church on one occasion, and there were a number of visitors that morning, and uh, I brought people out for prayer. And uh, I was praying, why would you want me to pray? Why do you want me to pray? And this lady, just about to pray for her, and the Lord says, don't pray for her. Don't pray for her. I said, Lord, I can't not pray for a person. It's, you know, rude. He said, don't pray for her. So I said to this lady, I said, um, this is, I, said, I didn't know she was a visitor. I said, no, I was, you're the next in line to be prayed for, and God told me not to pray for you. Oh, and she looked quite upset. Not crying or anything, but upset. And I said, why have you come out anyway? She said, well, I've had this condition that's been wrong for a long, long time. Uh, and the doctors can't find out what it is. And, um, and the Lord spoke to me, gave me a word of knowledge. I said, can you tell me when this started? She says, 12 years ago. I it for 12 years. I said, well, the Lord won't let me pray for you. She said, why not? I said, can I ask you another thing? I said, Lord, help me here. He says, did you fall out with your best friend 12 years ago? She says, yes, it happened just after I we broke relationship. I said, well, do you know I don't need to pray for you? You need to go back, pick up your phone, write an email, and get it right. When you get it right, you're going to be here. See, sometimes we've got to work out. Someone say, work out. Our salvation with fear and trembling. Let's pray together and... Uh, well, if I let's stand together, my last time with you, it's been an absolute joy to be with you over this time. And uh, I just want God's bless for all, best for all your lives. Father, thank you for the place at Calvary where we step down from our vantage point of observing the things of God to the feet of Jesus at the foot of that sycamore tree. And we allowed you to look at our life. And having looked at it, we turned and we changed and we became new creatures in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your challenge to us today that we need to step out like Nicodemus and Joseph around the cross and make our position clear. But, Father, don't let us be like the one who gets to the edge of the empty tomb but doesn't enter into the resurrection truth. Help us to be like John who comes and uh, like Peter who comes on afterwards, though later, and enters right in even though he came in late. And can I say this to those of you who are standing here, to those of you who not been Christians very long, you say, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so in this church, they've been Christians for 30, 40 years, and I've only been a Christian a year, so I don't expect God to bless me very much because they were there before me. Friends, you know what my prayer is as an older man, um, is, as an old man, I suppose, is this. Father, thank you that I've got to the empty tomb, but I want younger Christians and younger people not only to get to where I am, but overtake me. Yes. And, and forgive me, Lord, if because of my age, I become tired. Forgive me if because of uh, my age, I become complacent. Lord, I pray for young men and women to reach what I've got there first, but overtake me and enter in to all that you've got. And I'm praying that over you. Don't let the devil put you down. Don't let the devil put you down. Overtake those who've got there first. If they're really strong men and women in God who've been Christians a long time, They'll be light, they delighted that you enter in and you discover things for yourself. So, Father, bless each one in this place. Bless this church. May your hand be upon Pastor Denver, Lord. Uh, you, every, uh, Lord, I pray you bless him in body, in soul, and in spirit. And each one of us, as we stand before you, in amen. Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Um, amen. I'm going to take a joyful offering this morning uh, as well, just to um, everything that comes in this morning, uh, unless it's tithed, um, unless it's marked tithe. So if you give on a, on a Sundays into tithing into the church, um, please mark that if you can. If not, everything else that comes in this morning is going to go towards uh, the guests that have come to serve us. Nobody has asked for anything this weekend, but we believe in blessing men and women of God and sending them away to the next assignment. How many of you know that, you know, S Steve and Velvet and, and Lara and Corbin and, uh, you know, we've got John with us. How many of you know that these guys are part of our family? 
And so they're going to go to another assignment. Wherever that assignment's going to be, in the UK, across the globe, we don't know. But we have an opportunity of sowing into them as our brothers and sisters to go on that assignment around the globe. And so I don't know about you, but I get a great privilege of that. Amen. I don't get to travel all that often. I'm pastor, but John travels and the guys we worship. And it's great to see that we can be a part of sending them to the next assignment. And so let's give generously, give freely if we can. Uh, we're going to pass the basket around this morning, um, if we can. And um, if you can pass it around for us, Keith, is that all right? And um, if you can give generously, if you need to write a check, make it out to New Life Community Church. And uh, please be generous in your giving. The details are also on the screen. Um, have we got the details there, Pete, on the screen for the finances? Uh, if anybody would like to give online, the details will be on the screen. It is a business account. Uh, even though we're a charity in a church, you've got to go on the business tab uh, to give that. Um, we're incorporated company with that. And uh, if you want to just put together on there, so if you put together as a reference, and uh, please give, please give generously. If you want to give by bank transfer, and we do thank those that partner with the house, those that give tithes and offerings. We thank you. Everybody comes voluntary. Everybody gives voluntary. And we are very good stewards of what we do with the finances of the church. We make sure things are ring fenced. But we do want to send them away blessed uh, this weekend as, a, as, a, as they go on to the next assignment in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for every person represented here, every household. We thank you for, um, Lord, even those that are part of other churches that may be with us this morning. Uh, in our community, in the BD and LS postcode, we pray, Lord, that the economy, Lord, in this whole region would be the best it is, Lord, around the United Kingdom. We pray, Lord, for jobs and better jobs. We pray, Lord, for uh, wages and wage increases. Lord, we pray, Lord, for finances from unexpected sources. Lord, we pray for checks in the mail we didn't realize they're coming. And cash advancements for the extension of your kingdom. Lord, I pray, Lord, for every business represented here, that, Lord, they would have doors and double doors open to them. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would... Um, bring wisdom and knowledge and understanding to them. I pray, Lord, for every household, Lord, anybody that's in debt, Lord, anybody that's struggling with finances, that you would, um, Lord, give them a good stewardship over their finances. And I pray, Lord, more than anything else, Lord, that these finances would be blessed, Lord, for the extension of your kingdom. Lord, not only here in Yeadon and this district, Lord, but also around the UK and even abroad. In the precious name of Jesus, never is said, amen. Hallelujah.